Wisdom be under every stone you turn. Let truth be key to freedom and bind you to the path that holds the line. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the CMRB Regional Growth Plan Open House. Um, our focus today is on the effects of the growth plan for community members and so we're happy to focus our, um, our content on that as well. We have two more open houses coming up next week, uh, one with a business focus and another with an environmental focus. So um, thank you for joining us today where you're welcome to join all three, um, but just wanted to, to frame up what the focus will be for today. Um, I'm Anne Harding. I am with the consultant team. I'm a born and raised Calgarian and uh, really pleased to be here to host this conversation today um, about the, the regional growth plan that's been in the works for, for a long time now and, uh, and that we're excited to, to share and, and to hear from you about your questions to understand the, the growth plan a little bit better so that you're able to provide some meaningful input. Um, I'll begin with a, an acknowledgement of the gratitude that I feel for, for being here, born and raised in Treaty 7 territory, um, the home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika Kainai Pakani, the Stony Nakoda Nations of Chiniki, Bears, Pa, and Wesley, and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, as well as Satana Nation. And just um, the gratitude that I feel for, for calling this wonderful and diverse uh, land my home and, uh, and the teachings that I've had from all of the people here, including yourselves. Um, so we're here for 90 minutes today. Um, show you what we're, what we're gonna talk about. Um, so we are on, on Zoom in this webinar format. We'll start with just a bit of housekeeping items. Um, we have Jordan Copping here from the CMRB to, to share a bit about uh, about the CMRB and uh, and I know there's been lots of questions coming through about um, the what the board is and how it's structured and so Jordan will will walk through some of that as well. Um, I'll give a bit of an overview of the public engagement to date. So this is phase three. We started last summer um, and and have had over five thousand participants. So we're looking forward to also um, in. Recapping for those who have been along the journey with us, I know there's some of you online as well, um, as well as new folks who are, are just sort of joining this process. So we'll recap some of that and then just get into the draft plan. So the two features being preferred place types and preferred growth areas. And, and we have our folks from HDR CalCorp here in Calgary um, and in Portland to support uh, us learning about that as well. We do have, have a Q&A, and so there's a few different ways that you, can, that you can participate. The intention for today is very much to give you the opportunity to learn about the draft plan, to answer your questions so that you're able to um, provide thoughtful input to the discussion forums and the survey that's online. Um, so our focus is going to be on pulling out your questions. So Lara's already started in the chat box to ask you um, what you're hoping to get out of today, please do, do feel free to use the chat box for, met, for questions. Um, you can also use the Q&A function in Zoom. And if you're asking a question through the Q&A, you can also see the questions that other people have asked and um, upvote them. So you can say, yes, that's the question that I want to amplify or make sure gets answered. Um, that's coming from your, your neighbors and colleagues. So we'll invite you to use the, the Q&A function. That's where we'll be looking to first um, for, for questions to be answered, but we'll do our best to, to pull questions from where they come. Um, we'll have a few polls as well along the way um, that you can just click a response on. That allows us to get a lot of input really quickly and also to get a sense of you and your experience with the engagement process and, and within the region as well. Um, and, then, and then we'll also have a couple of opportunities along the way for open mic. And so that will be right now, you're all um, muted, you're all, your cameras are all off, um, but we, will, we would like to, to get a bit of a flavor for, for who's in the region. And so um, along the way, we'll have a couple of specific questions. And if you're feeling comfortable um, answering those questions, um, you can use the raise hand function in, in Zoom and, uh, and we'll call on, on a couple of folks to share that, um, share their, their thoughts. So that's, this is our outline for, for what we'll focus on today. 
I want to acknowledge that there um, there's been a lot of conversation about this plan, um, a lot of it in the media, and and a lot of it um, looking for uh, additional information. And, and so people have asked questions that they have been prompted to ask. Um, and so we look forward to answering those today. As I mentioned, we also recognize that there are people here who have not yet made up their mind about the plan, who are looking for more information. Um, and, and so we're really hoping that this can be a respectful space for everybody to be able to have that, that open dialogue and leave space for people to, to make up their minds and make up their own minds. So what I'm, I'm gonna ask is, is that we're able to respect all opinions that will keep uh, the questions and, and conversation in chat respectful. Certainly we can disagree with one another. That's what makes us a vibrant region. Um, but let's let's continue to, to show each other that respect. And, and maybe let's open ourselves up to some curiosity about what might be important for other people as well as what might be important for ourselves. Um, we make better decisions when we learn from each other and, and learn together. And so I'll, I'll encourage you if you're open to it to, to have some curiosity as well for the experiences that other people might be having and, and the views that they might be holding. Um, when you do speak for yourself, speak, please uh, speak for yourself um, using sort of statements that reflect your own experience. And, and again, just asking that you're perhaps able here to listen, to understand and, and to um, open to disagreement. We recognize that there are diverse views. And so we hope to reflect some of that in the, um, in the content that we have today and ask, ask for that respect as well. And, and I'll just ask if there are other things that you're looking for, and, and I'm sure we've had some of that in the chat as well, um, to get out of today what you need to be able to have a productive conversation um, and, and to get what you want out of today's session. But we do wanna to get to know you a little bit better as well. So Lara, I'll get you to launch that first poll um, and this first question. So you'll see a few options show up on your screen. Um, and so the, the questions are just, this is to get you used to the polling function, uh, which season do you enjoy most um, here in, in the CMR? Um, personally, I kind of like it when we have all four seasons in one day, um, but folks are responding. So you just click the answer that, that suits best for you. And I see we've got a number of folks. I'll leave this open for maybe another couple seconds while we pull this out. We don't have anybody who likes winter yet. I'll just say that. Um, okay, we can end the, in this poll and, and show it so you're used to the polling. People are really appreciating the summer, so that's great. Um, we'll, let's see, we'll take the next poll as well there, Lara. Uh, poll number two. Um, again, this is getting to know you a bit better. So best describing where you're from. So we recognize that within the Calgary metro region, we have rural perspectives, we have urban perspectives, and we have people who hold both of those experiences. You might live in one area and work in another. You might have grown up in one and work in another. Um, and it's important for us, as, as we'll talk through the plan, that we have a balance, that we recognize and we celebrate the, the rural and urban differences within the community. Um, so we have most folks responding to that, so we can share those, close that and share those results as well. Um, so we see that the majority of, of people on, on the call hold uh, rural, and both urban and rural perspectives, but there's a really good split here. So thank you to, to everybody who's made the offer, made the chance to join us. We have somebody joining from outside of the region. So, so thank you for that as well. And then I think we've got two more polls that, that we'll use to get sort of this introduction part out of the way. So we'll go to the next one, which is, is wondering how, about how long you've lived in the Calgary metro region. So again, we talk about the diversity. This plan is about planning for the next million residents who will come to this region. Um, and so we know that, that we want to welcome those people to this region, the economic development that that brings, the diversity of thought and views and interests that, that will help uh, build on the strengths of the communities that we have. Um, and so it's, it's good for us to know uh, sort of who's on this call and where, who's holding those perspectives of long time or short time um, folks in the region. So we'll close that poll down. We've got most people responding um, and a good split. A good mix, some majority over, over 30 years in the region. So a lot of good experience here, but a few folks who, who are newer to the region as well. So thanks for joining us. And we'll have one last, uh, last poll here. 
about um, your experience. So this, this is an engagement process. So just, as I said, this uh, open house is to um, support you to get a better understanding of the, of the regional growth plan so that you're able to um, participate through, we have uh, quick polls, discussion forums, and a survey. And, and so hopefully not all of you have filled out that survey yet. Um, that you're here to learn before sort of making that decision. I know I've heard from a few folks who have said, we'll hold off on the survey until we learn more. Um, so appreciate appreciate that you're here to, to learn as well. Um, and, and thanks, Karen. I've got to just notice your question there of how many people are participating. We have 55 people um, attending here today. We had 73 register, which is about the same as the open house that we had in the second phase um, of engagement last November. Um, and so we'll close this poll down and just to, to see if people are coming, having engaged on the website already and uh, about two thirds, one third there. So we've got a lot of information to, to share that will provide an overview. Some people have asked questions in advance based on what's on the website. And so we look forward to, to answering those as well. So I think that does it for me for now. And so I will share a different screen and ask Jordan to turn your camera on and to introduce yourself. And I will pop into the background while you do give your uh, presentation, but then I might interject um, afterwards with a few questions. Sure, thanks so much, Laura, and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Jordan Copping, and I'm the Chief Officer of the Calgary Metropolitan Region Board. I'm here just to give you a little bit of background about the board. Uh, before we get into what you really want to talk about, which is the growth plan. Can we go to the next slide, please? So growth management boards, there is one in Calgary and one in Edmonton. Uh, the one in Edmonton was formed in about 2008, and the one in Calgary was formed in 2018 as a result of the modernized MGA. So on January 1st, 2018, uh, the CMRB came into existence, and uh, we started building the organization from there. There are five employees, including myself, with the CMRB, and our board is comprised of elected officials from the 10 member municipalities. Can we go to the next slide, please? So here, it's just a quick map of the 10 member municipalities. Just for a bit of information, the province, when they chose to create the board, set a threshold of 5,000 uh, people population in a community that uh, in order to be a member on the board. So you'll see that Turner Valley and Black Diamond are not board members, <clears throat> nor is Crossfield is because they don't meet that 5,000 uh, population threshold. Our region is very large. We have more than 9,000 square kilometers. And because of that size and because of the beautiful part of the world we live in, it's quite diverse, which means, um, you know, as we are going through and developing the plan, it is important to understand all those perspectives. And currently we're home to about one and a half million people. And as Anne already mentioned, we are looking to, for this plan, to start to plan for the next million people coming to the region. Can we go to the next slide, please? Just a little bit about the way the board is structured. Uh, while the province created the board and determined who would be board members, uh, the board had the ability to determine its own structure after that. So as you can see, we currently have three committees that report up to the board. The, uh, we originally had four. The land use committee was one and the servicing committee was another. However, as the board was working together, uh, we came to the realization that combining those two committees into one made a great deal of sense. So we have the land use and servicing committee, a governance committee, and an advocacy committee. If we go to the next slide, please. Through 2018, the board was working on an interim growth plan, which was essentially a way to ensure that development could continue while the board worked together uh, building the growth plan. In the fall of 2018, or actually it would say winter, uh, December 2018, the board came together and started to do some visioning work to see where they would like to focus. And they came up with these six focus areas. Uh, they're listed there, I won't read them out, but it is through this lens that the growth plan uh, is being developed to ensure that uh, these six areas are kind of the, the focus areas of the plan. Go to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> the growth and servicing plans enact the vision and priorities of the board. Originally, when the regulation was introduced, the plans were to be delivered to the minister no later than December 31st, 2020. However, in June of 2020, the board asked the minister for an extension 
And uh, in October of 2020, uh, then Minister of Municipal Affairs, Allard, granted an extension to March 1st of 2021. With this, uh, we had originally asked for an extension of four months. So with this slightly truncated timeline, the board, uh, the consultant and administration set to working to meet it. However, in about mid to late January, it became evident that meeting this deadline would perhaps not be in the best interest of the region. And so at the January 29th meeting of the board, the board uh, passed a motion asking the minister to grant us an extension to June the 1st to finalize the plans before they're submitted. And one of the main reasons was so that we could host this third round of public engagement. The regulatory uh, requires what has to be in there, but it's up to the board about how we must meet it. And it's just a little bit of information there. The growth plan must be reviewed every 10 years and the servicing plan every five. Next slide, please, Anne. I won't go too deep into this, but there are a number of policy areas which must be included in the growth plan. Uh, and there are things like planning corridors for recreation, transportation, energy, identifying environmentally sensitive areas, coordinating infrastructure and development amongst the municipalities, identifying policies for new settlement areas and how we intensify our existing settlement areas, the conservation of ag lands and specific actions to implement the growth plan. And really it is here in meeting these requirements that we're gonna go through with the consultants, uh, the growth plan. The servicing plan is a little bit different in the sense that the only must in the regulation is that it must support the development outlined in the growth plan and then it may include what you see on the list there. At present, the board has decided to focus on transportation, including transit, water, wastewater, stormwater, uh, and recreation in the servicing plan. However, as the board goes forward and decides on future scope of work, they could start to include other areas there. With that, I will hand it back over to you, Anne. Thanks a lot, Jordan. And um, so if I can keep you on for, for a minute. So we've had um, sort of some questions and concerns and just can you clarify who is on the board? Sure, so the board is uh, comprised of 10 members and I don't know if we can go back to that slide, but so in that map, it kind of highlights it, but it's Airdrie, Calgary, Chestermere, Cochrane, Foothills, High River, Okotoks, Rocky View County, Strathmore and Wheatland County are the 10 members. And then who comprises the board of this small crown corporation are elected officials from each of those 10 member municipalities. Currently, each municipality has chosen to have their mayor or reeve be the board member on this. However, they are able to appoint a delegate as well. So if they're not able to attend a meeting, then uh, another member of council is able to participate in their stead. Okay, so it is the elected officials that are actually on the board. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, perfect. And um, there's a question around uh, the creation of this board. And, and so I guess the relationship between the province or just how this board actually came about, if you can tell us a bit more about that story. Sure. So um, as I kind of mentioned before, the Edmonton board, which was originally the Capital Region Board, was created in about 2008. Uh, and has been an ongoing organization since then. In um, 2016, 2017, the provincial government made the determination that they wanted to uh, create a growth management board for the Calgary metropolitan region in order to get some uh, efficiencies from municipalities working together in the region. So the province made that determination in about 2016, 2017, negotiated with the 10 member municipalities uh, in terms of what the regulation would look like and how this board would come into being. Um, Subsequent to that, uh, there was a change in government and there was a little bit of question as to whether or not the, the current government, the UCP, was also supportive of the growth management boards. However, in the letters that we received from Minister Allard and the subsequent letter that we received from Minister McIver, they both expressed a strong degree of support for growth management planning in the region. Thanks a lot. Um, and so we've just had a question from Brian um, and, and echoed by uh, Guy as well. If, if you can explain the voting structure of the board. So does each board member have equal voting power or is it population based? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure, happy to do so. Okay, so the way that the regulation lays out the voting structure for the board, and it's important to note that this is only for the board. For committees, uh, the board members decided that they would just do simple majority. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so uh, something could pass a committee with six members voting for it and it goes forward for debate at the board. However, how the vote is at the board is determined by the regulation and the way it is it's a, a double majority so that two thirds of the members 
who represent two thirds of the population must vote in favor of something for it to pass. So what this means on the ground is that seven members must support a motion in order for it to pass. And one of those members must be the city of Calgary because they uh, alone, and I'm gonna get the percentage a little bit wrong, but uh, are about 85% of the population of the Calgary metropolitan region lives in the city of Calgary. Perfect, so say that one more time, two thirds of members representing two thirds of the population for something to pass. Correct. So seven members, including Calgary, have to vote for something in order for it to pass. So this leads to, um, you know, and I just saw it pop up on the chat um, that there is a veto power. Uh, and so just for clarity on that, Calgary is able to stop something from happening if they do not vote for it. However, it's important to note that Calgary cannot make anything happen if they do not vote for it. And also if four of the members choose not to vote for something, it doesn't pass. So it is a uh, unique voting structure in the province for sure. Um, however, in dialogue with the province, the reason that they implemented this voting structure was to try to accommodate the let's say, dis large discrepancy in the population which resides within the city of Calgary and then uh, the population which resides in the other nine member municipalities. Awesome. Um, and so one more question on the structure of the board, is there an appeal process within it? Mm -hmm currently working on an appeal process and the intent is to have that uh, passed by the board and submitted to the province for approval uh, no later than June the 1st, which is when we also need to submit the growth and servicing plan. Okay, perfect. And um, just a, Ron has uh, mentioned that the board was created by an order in council. Um, just you can confirm that that was the case. Um, not exactly. So the board is actually created uh, through legislation. The, the ability for growth management boards was created through legislation. And the province has recently, uh, well, recently in December, they introduced and passed Bill 48, one of the red tape reduction acts. And what that allows the province to do is pull out some of the requirements of growth management boards from the legislation and put those requirements into regulation. What this will do is give uh, a little bit more flexibility so that all boards in the province don't necessarily have to meet the same requirements. However, in dialogue with the province, it is our understanding that they're not intending to make any sweeping changes to the requirements uh, for the Calgary Metropolitan Region Board. They just want that flexibility so that if uh, another area of the province chose to form a growth management board because the uh, legislation allows for that, that they don't necessarily have to meet all the same requirements that the boards in Calgary have to do. Got it. Okay, I have two more questions for you and then I'm going to let you go and move on and I'll bring you back after. Sure. Um, and so David, I see your question will address the um, sort of considerations around uh, by Skir, Turner Valley, Black Diamond when we start talking about Hamlet growth areas. So I'll get you to just hold tight. Um, Annette has asked if there's um, environmental or social organizations represented on the board. Um, and, and if not, then how are, I guess, how are those um, perspectives considered? Sure. So I uh, know they're not represented on the board. The board is solely comprised of elected officials from the 10 member municipalities. However, in the creation of, um, or while we were developing the uh, growth management plan, uh, the board created what is known as an external technical advisory group or external tag. And that is comprised of a number of interests, uh, including, and I may miss someone here because I don't have the list right in front of me, but uh, members from the development community, residential development community, commercial and industrial development community, uh, organizations such as the Calgary Regional Airshed Zone and uh, BRBC, Bow River Basin Council, as well as the Calgary Real Estate Board. In addition to uh, representatives from certain provincial departments, uh, such as Environment and Parks and Department of Transportation. Uh, and certainly that's up to the board to say who would be on that external group. So if there were other organizations that should be part of that tag, the board members could suggest that. Yeah, so at the time it was presented to the board and the board agreed with the, the composition and passed, uh, giving us the ability to go forward and, and work with those groups uh, as we develop the, the growth and servicing plan. Awesome. And so a question that we had submitted ahead of time was if the province or cities have tried to implement something similar in the past. Um, and if so, what was the outcome? Sure. Um, so the EMRB, which was formerly the Capital Region Board, uh, has been in existence since 2008. And prior to the creation of the CMRB, there was the Calgary Regional Partnership, 
which was in existence from about 2004 to about 2018. Um, and then they closed down, wound down operations when the CMRV came into existence. Uh, and that was a voluntary organization. And it was uh, a similar pattern or, or land uh, area to the current board. It was a little bit bigger and included a few more members. However, they were not able to actually come to an agreement on a growth plan. And that is part of the reason that it led the province to creating the, the CMRB. Awesome. And I have one more question just because people are upvoting it. Just to clarify, um, the role of the City of Calgary that could trump or veto any or, and all proposals from external stakeholders. So can they stop future development outside of the Calgary city limits? Could they stop it? Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a unique question. So as we are developing the growth uh, plan and are identifying, you know, more efficient patterns of growth and ways that we can do a, a service that more efficiently and effectively, um, the city is going to, the 10 board members will vote on that. And then the agreement that we are striking through that is that if uh, you're developing in that area, then yes, uh, that is good to go. Subsequently to that, there is what is known as the regional evaluation framework. And that is any uh, statutory plan that is above a certain um, regional threshold, which is still being discussed, that will uh, come to the board as well. Staff then takes that in, looks at it, reviews and makes a recommendation. And then uh, it is possible for the board to challenge and to vote against that. And we have seen three uh, challenges through the IGP. Um, and yes, if Calgary did not vote to support something, then no, it would not pass. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take you off the hot seat for now and I'll bring you back after. Um, but appreciate that. And thank you everybody for, for the questions and, and uh, keeping, keeping that respectful, mostly comments um, in there. So thank you for, for that as well and for those great questions. I'm gonna keep us moving along so that we can get to the content. The next half hour or so we have sort of focused on um, the specific growth plan that's the subject of, of this engagement process. Um, but we will have some time in there, as, as I said, for that open mic and Q&A as well. So, um, Jordan, you're good to turn your camera back off while I share a bit about public engagement to date. So, um, as I mentioned, this is the third phase of, of public engagement, and I know there's been some comments that we've received questions ahead of time of, of why does this feel so rushed? Are we ramming this through? Um, how come this is the first time I'm hearing about this? Um, and, and so I think with with many public engagement processes, we, we are as good as our communication. Um, and I'd offer that I think in, in certain areas, there's been different and stronger communication in this third round than there's been in previous rounds. And so, um, so we're certainly seeing um, more strength in attention um, than we've seen, but, but we have had, had some meaningful input along the way. So I wanted to, to share a bit of that with you um, for folks who aren't, aren't aware of that. Um, so within, within those different phases, they, they let us, uh, they had different roles within the formation of the, of the growth plan. The first plan was to find out what people care about, um, was very much to, we had um, some three different scenarios, ways of approaching growth, including let's keep doing what we've been doing um, and let's have some stronger and higher intensity growth and let's have some targeted growth in, in specific areas with more mixed use. Um, and so we asked for input on those three scenarios. We said, what direction do you want us to, to go as we continue to build the growth plan? In the second phase, we had one proposed scenario and, and that scenario was based on what we'd heard in what was, what was important to people in that first phase. Um, and, and then we said, okay, here's, here's what we're thinking and asked people to comment on that. And that was last fall. The first phase was July, August of last year. And the second phase was in November of last year. So with from those first two phases, we had over 5,000 people um, from the region visit the website. The way that we've offered the opportunity, we know we're in COVID times. And so um, the opportunity to meet in person was not available to us, but we were able to um, host an online space where people could engage in the way that uh, worked for them. So for people who wanted to get into some dialogue and back and forth, um, about what mattered to them. We had discussion forums and we had a lot of open text comments so people could tell us how um, decisions that were being made in the growth plan would impact them. So we found those really helpful um, in informing the policies that you see reflected in the growth plan. 
Um, but we also had some quicker opportunities for people to engage or people to just read about the growth plan and not need to um, necessarily contribute, but we recognized that they were informing themselves. Um, so, so we have had, had relative strength of engagement um, for the couple first phases, especially as, as we look to planning for long-term um, growth policy. Uh, that's, that's not something that people tend to get really jazzed about and, and excited about. So we were really pleased with, with the uh, engagement that we did have. Um, our key metric, I wanted to make sure that we were clear about how we're, we're balancing engagement. Our key metric is, is to look at a geographic distribution. And so we've talked about the differences in, in rural and urban interests and the need to balance that. Um, so all along the way, we've been saying, is our engagement reflective of the region? And, and so we've, we've had relatively representative um, with actually less, less engagement from, from Calgary than their population size um, and, and varying sort of strength of engagement from other parts of the region, but largely in line with the geographic distribution of, of where people live and where the residents are. What we heard in the first phase, um, so these were when we had those three different scenarios and we asked people what mattered to them or what they liked or what they didn't like. Um, people said they wanted more density. They didn't want as much growth and, and sprawl was a word that we heard a lot. Um, we also heard the importance of diversity and diversity of choice. And so when Steve um, tells you a little bit more about the growth plan, he'll talk about how there are different choices and, and different options for rural development and, and urban development, not painting the full region with the same brush. Um, considering environmental implications, providing guidelines for developers, there was a strong interest in um, let's be clear about, about how we're planning to grow as a region um, so, that, so that we can make the best use of our resources um, collectively and, and not be driven by, um, by particularly developer interest was something that came out um, and, and, and stronger collaboration was while maintaining autonomy. And so again, what you'll hear Steve talk about with the plan is, is in finding that balance. Um, in, so all of this is still available on the engagement website. So you can go back and see what was shared in, in previous rounds. Um, in the discussion forums, we have very specific examples of here's what you told us and here's how that was incorporated into the development of the, the scenario that was shared in November, um, which is what the current plan is, is built on with some enhancements um, based on the feedback that we'd had in that second round. So just want to point you to there um, and certainly we can follow up with a more clear link to that um, if you're interested in seeing how that engagement was used. In the second round, when we shared the proposed approach, um, we, we had strong support for mixed use developments, especially in urban areas. We again heard the importance of uh, maintaining rural character and having the, those opportunities for, um, for rural development to be different than, than urban um, development. Really strong support for minimizing land consumption. That's a large driver, um, a large interest that we've heard in the region that, that is behind the plan um, and the choices that, that are made in the draft plan that you see that we've heard from, from the public is important to them, as well as minimizing water use and, and minimizing environmental impacts. And again, um, strong collaboration to share costs and share services in an equitable way. So you'll see that reflected in the plan when we look to the joint planning areas as well. Um, so definitely the choices in the plan are, have, been, um, have been made as a result of what community members have told us has been important to them. Um, and, and through an approach that, that community members told us that they wanted to see. Um, the, the projected outcome, so the purpose of, the, of this planning is, is to, met, to have benefits of working together as a region. Um, from a impact, regional impact perspective, the plan results in less water use, in um, less environment, environmental impact from carbon, uh, less vehicles on the roads, less need for roads, less cost of roads and, and new infrastructure. Again, because we're, we're focusing development and 41% and less land consumed than if, um, if we continued to grow the way that business as usual, the way that we have been growing. Um, so I think that's, oh, and it's just again, in how we use what we heard, this is a bit of a drip to, to what you'll be hearing about shortly. 
um, is a focus on preferred place types. So having three different um, preferred mixed use development, so preferred ways of developing. And so Steve will talk a bit more about what each of these are, but certainly they're in alignment with what we heard uh, from the first and second round of engagement. Um, and then having pre preferred growth areas, as I've talked about, focusing growth specifically um, in urban municipalities and hamlet growth areas and in joint planning areas, those places where um, services and infrastructure can be, can be shared. And so that that all aligns with with what we heard. And I think I think I might, Lara, can you remind me? Do I have a poll up for if folks participated? Yes. So we'll run uh, poll number five just to see if there are folks who participated in um, phase one or phase two. All right, and I see we've had a few more folks join us. So we have 61 people on for, for people who are keeping track. So thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, more recently here. And most folks have voted. I'll give it another couple seconds. Okay, and we'll end that poll. Thanks very much. Um, and so about two thirds have, have not participated or were not part of that first or second round of engagement. And so um, I fully appreciate that then if this is the first time you're hearing about it and if you weren't part of that original, those original phases that this does come, come as a surprise. And this is um, the challenge that we, we face in, um, in public engagement, in people wanting, asking people to get involved and when we're encouraged um, to participate. So we have certainly, we've had bold signs in communities. Um, COVID has really limited our advertising. So in our first round, we did have postcards and posters up in libraries when they were open or in municipal offices. Um, and so, so yes, we, we worked on social media. All of the municipalities um, had the opportunity to, to share out and to amplify through their uh, communication channels. Um, so certainly we did, we did aim. And so um, appreciate that, that there are views about a relatively small sample of, you know, 5,000 compared to 1.5 million people. Um, I think what we were focused on was hearing what matters to people and that geographic distribution. So we certainly did get um, consistent themes and, and input. And again, from long-term regional growth plan policy, um, we actually, we considered this a, um, a, a fairly strong um, engagement and, and stronger than I think we would have had if we had had um, only in-person open houses. We had hoped to be able to do both, um, but we were we needed to force our, our uh, efforts online. So I'll, I'll pause here and I, I see there's been a lot of sort of questions coming and I hope that I've covered some of them, but maybe what I'll do is I'll invite Steve to come on and, and to actually no, what I'm gonna do, I wanna hear from you guys. I've been talking long enough. Um, so I would love to hear if there's somebody who um, maybe participated in the first uh, first or second round of engagement, um, who, if you can raise your hand and maybe just share a bit about that experience. Um, because we know we have two thirds of our folks who weren't part of that. Uh, and, and if there's somebody, Kimberly, I see you have a hand up. Are you willing to, to unmute and open your mic? Let's see here. That might have been a miss. That was accidental. I apologize. Okay. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes. Um, did you have any any comments you wanted to share about the engagement so far? Um, no, I'm sorry. That was accidental. The raise hand. Okay. No worries. We have Davin who is is online as well. So Davin, Perfect. I'll take here. Hi. Yeah, I participated in, in uh, I believe, both rounds. Um, it was interesting. However, you know, I found the process really railroaded my answers. There were, it was multiple choice only. It presented three scenarios that I, none of which I really thought resonated or would serve the interests of the area and really only gave me the choice to say, you know, which of those I preferred. Uh, I also found most of the questions really said, you know, uh, <laughs> 
they were they were very leading. I it had I had to either choose um, sprawl or no sprawl or you know cars or no cars. But I don't think that's the way the world works. I think there are lots of other alternatives, and it didn't give any opportunity for me to present my vision for the region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for sharing. Um, we certainly did did try to have those opportunities through uh, through the discussion forums and and the open text to say which which are the attributes of the scenarios and, and certainly what we've moved forward with um, is not the uh, not the not any one of the scenarios. We've taken a blend of what we heard what we heard mattered to to people based on the the interests of the of the board so but thank you thanks Davin for for sharing that appreciate that uh, in these processes it doesn't always feel good to be limited to only certain choices when you have have a bigger vision so um, appreciate you sharing I'm gonna move along and uh, Steve will ask you to take your put your camera on and and unmute yourself and maybe walk us through there's two aspects of, of the plan so we'll do preferred place types first and and then move and leave that sort of person Q and A there, and I'll I'll catch up in the in the chat box. Great, thanks, Anne. Yeah, I'll just walk through some of the uh, the key aspects of the plan, and it's really focused on the the chapter called growth management and efficient use of land. That's that's the area that seems to be uh, garnering the most interest. Um, so just running through fairly quickly. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the goals here. Um, these aren't all of the goals that the board has set out for the region, but they are the ones to focus on, again, this growth management and efficient use of land area. So, um, you know, it, it speaks to the, the region growing in a, a way that balances a variety of land uses and capitalizes on, on growth opportunities, um, growing to reduce the amount of land and resources that are consumed, and uh, growing in a fiscally sustainable way and, and integrating our regional servicing as we go forward. Hey, next slide. It's based on what we call place types. Now, place types are, are probably, um, you know, except for those who are really into regional planning, are probably a, not a, a really common term. Um, but they are—they're not. Um, if you if you open up a, a land use bylaw or even a, a municipal development plan, you would see um, various land uses. These are not intended to be just land uses, but rather a combination of building types and street types and amenities and different land uses that are all mixed together to create. Uh, what we call a place type and they're intended to be quite general you know so we can have town centers you know that, that you know for example that the downtown portion of high river for example would be you know a town center and has a mix of shops it has a has some residential has some institutional there's some parks there's but it has a certain sort of feel and, and look to it um you might have medium density residential you might have single family residential which are also land use but when we speak in the terms terms of place types we're talking about the you know the, the mix of things that happen within within that grouping. So it's not just about one individual land use type. Right, next slide, please. So we have used six place types to describe the future growth in the Calgary region. And again, they're fairly general and, um, and they're not intended to cover every kind of um, land use or place type that exists today. For example, you, you won't see a downtown Calgary place type in there. And part of that is because that place type will be covered off by the infill and redevelopment. We're not proposing, for example, that another area of the region be developed like downtown Calgary to that density with, with high towers and everything else, but rather, um, you know, we, so we focused on the place types that are the types of growth we might see within the region. And so they are, they're infill and redevelopment, so places where, you know, there's some building happening already and we may have parking lots, you may have some space in between those buildings that need to, uh, uh, that could be opportunities for growth, um, and, and they would be redevelopment. Um, and you know, in, in, in filling the other space. Mixed use centers and transit oriented development spaces, a little higher density. And again, what you might find in the, uh, the town centers around the region, uh, some of the city centers and some of the more developed areas in Calgary. Um, and you know, taking advantage where there is transit to, uh, to develop around those. The master plan community is, is a place type that is very, very common in the Calgary region. And, and uh, you know, based on our, our assessment, you know, of around North America, Calgary actually does quite a good job of implementing master plan communities, uh, particularly within, within recent years. Um, and, and these communities are, um, you know, what you would find in most of your uh, newer neighborhoods in this region. Uh, they, have, they have some employment, they have some parks, they have some amenities. It's not just a single use. 
The one we've called subdivision in the growth plan is actually called residential community. This is more the traditional 1960s, 70s, 80s residential subdivision that is a single use. Um, it might have a school, but usually it's, it's just residential. And so you're not really able to easily walk to get, uh, get uh, to other amenities and to get to shops and that sort of thing. Um, again, very common in, uh, in, in decades, you know, sort of 50 years ago, less common today. Uh, the rural and the country cluster place type, it's a bit of a catch-all for, for many of the rural place types, but the, the idea is that, uh, you know, we're looking at country residential uh, developments uh, and speaking specifically around some of the country cluster forms that we're starting to see uh, become a little more common around, uh, you know, across Canada and around North America. And then finally, employment areas, and this is a, a broad, um, you know, a broad brush um, for all employment areas. It's not intended to be, you know, just... Uh, uh, just industrial or just office park or that sort of thing, but rather a, a catch to, um, you know, to, to deal with all, to all uh, major employment types. Next slide. Just very quickly, um, you know, some of the previous public input and, and Anne has talked a little more about these things, but, uh, you know, we, we did hear about, um, you know, the, the missing middle, I think one person called it, which I thought was quite, quite interesting around the, you uh, you know that we have very high density, we have very low density, but we were sort of missing the middle. Um, and that was something that came up as a, as a theme. Um, and and uh, you know, one, you see a little bit higher growth in places that are already served by transit, making good use of the, um, the um, uh, services we have and that sort of thing. It was interesting, we did this during uh, the era of COVID. Uh, the work from home is a very high percentage. I've, um, I've seen similar um, surveys like this and I've never seen work from home be quite so high and I would say that if we had done this a year and a half ago we wouldn't have seen the numbers on on that at, at work from home so you know we do recognize that COVID, COVID has changed attitudes but we also know from places where they have started to move out of it like Australia and New Zealand that uh, you know transit and active transportation modes for example uh, remain um, very very uh, important so uh, we don't want to lose that as well so uh, next slide so when we look at the, you know, I mentioned the, the subdivision or the uh, residential community place type that had been, had been the norm for a long time. Um, you know, really when we look at mixed use or the master plan types of uh, developments, we see substantially better outcomes um, in, in, a, in a number of different areas. So VMT, that's vehicle miles traveled. It could be VKT, vehicle kilometers traveled per household. Uh, you know, against a mixed use drop by 30% against um, a master plan community of 13% lower. Uh, we see development costs going down and with more compact development that you get with mixed with these mixed use types types um, the land consumption which is tied to the development costs very closely um, go down substantially as the water water uh, consumption per household utility costs per household again you're getting you know when you're a more compact um, uh, development type uh, your utility costs per household because you have less utilities per household, less you know length of pipe and less length of road, and that sort of thing goes down. And then your net carbon outputs per household, so your greenhouse gas emissions and the and the carbon released by residential development uh, go down quite substantially. Um, again, with those more compact forms. Uh, next slide. So that led us to a concept that we're calling preferred place types, and it's not to suggest that the that the others are, are bad, but when we look at focusing our growth in the future, um, you know, it really is trying to focus around some of the places where we see, um, you know, we can get some of those benefits that we, we've talked about. Um, so, you know, infill and redevelopment. So in areas, you know, that, uh, um, you know, mostly in the urban communities where there are opportunities to get a little more density in places that are already developed. Uh, the mixed use and um, mixed use, uh, and transit-oriented development. These are places that are going to be sort of town center or city center type of uh, development, where there's going to be a lot more amenities, and these places are going to be a lot more walkable. And then your master plan communities, um, where you have a mix of a mix of housing types, um, a little bit higher density, and ability to walk to uh, walk to your day-to-day -day, uh, amenities. But it is it is um, really as a mix of you. Uh, housing types. Most of your master plan communities are majority uh, single detached dwellings, but there will almost always be a little bit uh, of multifamily mixed in as well to get uh, you know, to get a mix of um, development types. Okay, next slide. So 
So when we talk about um, preferred place types, you know, there's lots of different ways we describe them, but probably the, the measure that most people look to is the, um, the dwelling units per acre, or dwelling units per hectare, however we want to, uh, to measure them. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea of what, what we have around the region, um, in Calgary, most of the new communities are running, are coming in at around 10 to 12 dwelling units an acre. In the other municipalities in the region, they're coming in at around yeah, eight and nine, like, you know, like Windsong and South Winds. Um, look at some of the older neighborhoods, Brentwood would fall into that uh, residential community. Um, it runs out five to six units an acre, um, and that includes some multifamily. Um, some of the older parts of High River and Okotoks, you're in the range of four and five dwelling units an acre. So these again are the, uh, those older communities were developed more as standalone residential communities. Um, some of the new areas in, in Rocky View, Harmony, uh, the developed area, and that's the area we're, we're concerned about is, is coming in about six dwelling units an acre. So it's a, a fairly dense, uh, dense community. Um, and other communities, some of the more, uh, you know, the acreages and that sort of thing are uh, in, in around that half. Uh, dwelling unit acre, and they vary quite, quite, quite significantly um, as you move through them. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about these preferred place types, and again, when we say preferred, it doesn't mean the only type type of growth, but rather the way where we're going to focus um, a good chunk of that next million people. Um, you know, we're talking about infill and redevelopment, so places like Curry Barracks in Calgary. Um, uh, you know, some of the other neighborhoods in uh, some of the other communities, a downtown fairly significant amount of um, infill and redevelopment in Cochrane. Um, you know, when we talk about master plan communities, um, you know, we're talking about um, the, within the growth plan, we're saying that in the Hamlet growth areas, so in the three counties um, where they've designated uh, areas for growth, uh, we'd like to see them being at six units an acre. So if you think about Harmony, the developed area of Harmony is six units an acre, that's kind of the uh, that and that's not for the full Hamlet growth area, but but a percentage of it. Um, again, focusing, trying to get a bit of a, a cohesive uh, community center in those areas. In other the other municipalities uh, outside of Calgary, um, the the um, master plan communities are eight dwellings an acre, and within Calgary at ten dwellings an acre. The mixed use transit oriented development uh, place type actually isn't regulated within the plan. Um, it's provided as guidance, but there is no actual regulation saying, you know, you shall have a certain amount of uh, mixed use and transit oriented development, but um, helping to, to guide what that should look like. And, and the, the intent is that there should be uh, some of these and the Hamlet growth areas, 12 dwelling units an acre. So that would be that immediate area around a really, really um, walkable little center to a, to a, a rural, uh, rural village or, or community. Um, other municipalities at 15 units an acre and Calgary at 20 units an acre. Again, though, these are, are intended as, as guidance. There is no, no regulatory component uh, uh, to the mixed use and transit oriented development, but rather encouragement that, uh, that these occur. All right, and I think, Anne, your next slide moves us into our, our first question. Sounds good. So this gives me an opportunity to to pull some of these the questions that we've heard um, in in the chat um, and and people who have shared those as well. So we had a question just on um, the TOD acronym, so transit oriented development, um, and and I think so. Let's see if there is specific questions related. Oh, and we, we talked about the outcomes and and sort of the reasons for for doing this. So Karen's asked if we can explain how water consumption decreases with more cluster living. So it's not like there will be less laundry or less showering. Yeah, the, the main answer to that is the is less less grass watering, um, particularly compared to the residential community. You're, you're going to have smaller lots um, and you know and, and smaller areas. And watering lawns is one of the big uh, one of the big consumers of, of water. So that's the uh, that's the biggest piece. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and, and I guess just Sam's also asked in a broader question about those pro the projected outcomes. And, and I know we've had some um, comments about those that we've seen on the engagement website as well. Um, so if you can, the, the sort of five outcomes that we showed, if you can talk to how those were arrived at. Sure. Yeah, so on those outcomes, so if, if you take a look at carbon per household, there's, there's two elements to that. And that is one of them is uh, around uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation and also around uh, emissions that that uh, houses give off um, and and really the the um, you know on the greenhouse gas emission side 
um, from travel, uh, probably one of the biggest ones is, is as you have more mixed use and you have more amenities that are close to you and close to what you want, uh, the less, less you need to drive. And they were actually the, the, um, the, the actual vehicle kilometers traveled uh, were derived in part from the Calgary Regional Transportation Model and then also looking at uh, comparable uh, communities and that sort of thing from, uh, from across North America. Uh, same thing on the on the housing side. Um, you know, as you get um, get more compact, uh, what you what you emit per household uh, goes down substantially. Particularly when you get some mixed use or sorry, some multifamily um, mixed into the uh, the single detached component as well. Uh, when we look at total utility costs, I've sort of mentioned this before, but the big one is, uh, you know, if you more compact development, uh, more concentrated means a lot less pipe uh, needs to go into the ground, and so the number of dwelling units that can be served per kilometer of pipe increases substantially, so your costs go down. Water consumption, we just touched on. Land consumption, I think, uh, you know, if we're talking about more compact, um, it, it, um, it, it really just takes up less land when you have a higher density of development. Uh, total development costs, and again, um, this comes down to, you know, building roads, building pipes, and you know, the original cost of putting these things in uh, when you are in a more compact form uh, particularly if you have a compact form that's contiguous, i.e. I. building onto something that's already there, um, your cost will come down to, to develop. And the vehicle miles per household, the vehicle kilometers per household, sort of the same thing as the greenhouse gas emissions, they go down once, uh, once people don't have to travel quite as far to get to, uh, uh, to what, they, what they need. And when the overall, you know, the, and, and when the overall um, footprint of the region comes down, it means that, you know, so that you're reducing sprawl, you're not having to drive as far, um, you know, to get to work, to get to wherever you need to be. Awesome, thanks. And, and so just, um, Art had, had asked just what the underlying assumptions are that had led to those outcomes. So thanks for walking us through some of those. And this was um, just, I guess, to clarify my understanding, the how the business as usual scenario, so growing mm -hmm. as, as we had been, compared with with the model for what's being proposed and, and that sort of difference is how we get to these outcomes is that right yeah the business yeah the business as usual assumes about the same mix of, of place types and and densities as we have today and it just continuing to move out compared to taking a um, you know a couple of other approaches and in the early stages we we started out with two scenarios that were relatively extreme, but uh, when we take sort of the better elements of each of them and the less extreme elements of each of them, we came up with a final scenario called the synthesis that um, you know gained very similar, um, very similar uh, outcomes and results uh, as going to the, the you know the, the compact growth scenario we had early on was a very extreme scenario that would have seen places like downtown Airdrie really increase in density, probably to an unrealistic level. But we were able to sort of mix mix and match pieces and come up with uh, some approaches that got us very comparable benefits without having to go quite as extreme. Awesome. And I'll just ask you one more question on this and there's we're getting some questions around the preferred growth areas. So we'll move to, to that next. Um, but just so confirming if the policy direction is that infill and redevelopment is mandatory, but mixed use is not. Or I guess what, so I don't think that's quite right, but if you can, I guess, clarify. Um, in, all of these preferred place types are being used or directed yeah. to be used in the plan. Yeah. In fact, infill and redevelopment is not mandated. Uh, we don't have minimum uh, minimum infill numbers. We're not at one point we did uh, we did toss that around, and it's not an uncommon uh, element to have in a regional or even a municipal plan to say that you know we want 10, 15, 20 percent of new new dwelling units shall be in infill. We we haven't done that. What we've done instead was. Uh, take the preferred place types and take all three of those preferred place types and put a minimum um, that's required. So, for example, the city of Calgary is required to have 90% of new residential growth be in one of those three preferred place types. Um, the other municip urban municipalities and in the joint planning areas were saying 75%, and the Hamlet Oath growth areas were saying that 60% would be in one of the three preferred place types. And of course, the way we've defined each of those place preferred place types varies again with the municipality and recognizing that that uh, that's how you get some diversity in the growth throughout the region. So again, saying that the the density, the minimum density of mixed use development, for example, in Hamlets is different than the minimum density of the city of Calgary or than in Airdrie. Yeah, so there's two components. One, the minimum density is different, but also the proportion 
that must be in a preferred place type. So for example, a hamlet growth area, the minimum density um, for the preferred place types is six, six dwelling units an acre and 60% of a hamlet growth area um, has to be in a preferred place type. The other 40% can be in whatever place type uh, um, it wants to be, uh, but 60%. So, but in the city of Calgary, the difference is that, that number, the minimum density is 10 units an acre and at 90% has to be in the minimum, it has to be in the preferred place types. So it varies depending on where you are. Awesome. So there is that diversity in different, different parts of the region. And just a last question, uh, Marla's asked um, if there were any considerations to potential social consequences of crowding people in higher density. And I'm going to pair that with a question from Tudor if like what other practices from around the world have been have been looked at um, or what we've been incorporated into this plan. Yeah, sure. So actually, I, you know, I, the the understanding and this this pulls on lots of lots of understanding of, of how communities and places work. Um, we're not mandating the kinds of densities you would see in downtown Calgary anywhere. Um, these are all densities that uh, will support mixed use development. And mixed use is known to have better outcomes um, socially for communities. Um, you know, in, in that when people can walk to where they, they their day-to-day -day needs, they're, they're going to do better. Um, when they don't have to travel as far, when they're in neighborhoods that are, and we're not talking about massive densities here. These are not, uh, these are not again, everybody living in a, in a high high rise tower. In fact, none of these densities uh, would require any kind of very high density uh, living. Um, you know, six dwelling units an acre is single family, you know, single detached dwellings. Um, so the intent is that, that we get people in compact enough communities that they can have amenities that we you, know, you can justify amenities and um, and that sort of thing, um, but yet not so dense that they they have to be living you know packed into you know downtown Vancouver a level of, of densities that that's not what we're calling for at all here. But dense enough that we can get uh, get the efficiencies and dense enough that you can actually develop amenities um, that support people's day to day day to day living. Um, and again, it's not 100% of the region doesn't have to be developed in preferred place types. It's, uh, it's you know, we've outlined the, uh, the areas within those proportions. So it's, this is not a 100% not a coverage uh, type of thing. It's even in the city of Calgary, we're not saying it has to be 100%. I know Calgary has talked about something that's closer to 100% being in these, these place types. It's certainly we're not, uh, we're not suggesting it needs to be. Okay, thanks so much. So we'll move. So we've got a number of questions sort of around um, the criteria that were used for preferred uh, growth areas and um, and sort of just understanding and so where are these in foothills and, and how is that determined so if you can talk through just the concept first and then and then we'll get there and just noting that we're probably in our last 20 minutes here so we're doing lots of good q a i do want to come back to to bring jordan back just uh, we've had a lot of questions again about voting structure and what that means for the plan. And so we'll come back to that. Uh, so I do see those questions and we'll make sure we get them after we've uh, covered this, this next portion of the plan. Great. So maybe, um, and I, I would actually suggest maybe jumping ahead two slides to the map because I think that covers everything that we, next one, there we go, good. I think we can speak to that and, and it will cover most of what we need to. So the preferred growth areas are, are those areas where growth is concentrated within the region. And again, it's not the only places growth can occur, but it is where we see the majority of growth. And the idea being um, that when you, when you identify areas for growth, you give the development community and others some certainty around where growth is going to be. It allows you to organize, um, organize growth uh, to provide services more efficiently. Um, and it, and it just tells people where thing where things are going to happen and, and that sort of thing. So again, not the only places that can have growth, but certainly the higher density growth is is uh, being encouraged in in these areas. So those areas are the urban municipalities. So you know, Calgary, Cochrane, Airdrie, Chestermere, Strathmore, Okotoks, High River, etc. Um, the the hamlet growth areas, which are um, certain hamlet areas within each of the counties. So within um, Wheatland, uh, we have one. Within uh, within Rocky View, we've identified three areas, and within Foothills is a bit different. Foothills is um, has three identified, but the locations haven't been identified, and that's through some discussion that we had with Foothills County as we were 
pulling it together. Foothills hasn't got uh, um, as many approved plans in place, say, as Rocky View does. So their, their preference was to have um, give some certainty that they would have a certain number of hammock growth areas, uh, but to leave the actual locations of them to a later date. And again, to, to make good use of things like, uh, you know, proposed servicing and that sort of thing and, and allow them to, um, to come back later and, and do that. So that's, that seems like a fairly reasonable, uh, reasonable thing to do. So again, the thing is the urban municipalities, the hamlet growth areas, and the third one is the joint planning areas. And these are actually the areas where the, the biggest amount of, of future um, higher use and urban and suburban growth is expected to occur. And it's places where they, they cross and are close to um, um, other boundaries. And if you can maybe move ahead, I don't think I need to do the next three. If we just go to the joint planning areas um, slide, one more. One more, sorry after that. All right, I'm just gonna pause on here because we've had a couple of okay. questions around um, the green box between Calgary and Cochrane. Yeah. And questioning why I think it's Cochrane North is not a growth area. Yeah, so Cochrane North, I believe, and I, I just have to dig back into my memory box here, but I, I did, didn't did mention one other important growth area and that is places where a statutory plan, so an area structure plan has already been approved are also areas where growth is allowed to occur. So we're not rescinding um, existing approved plans. If it's already an approved plan, it's in place, growth can occur. Um, it's a little light on this map that Anne has up right now, but there are some sort of um, hatched areas there that uh, show where there are area structure plans already approved. So those are also, um, they're not preferred growth areas necessarily, but they are areas where um, plans are in place and those plans may May, may go ahead as uh, as planned. So that Copper North is is actually an approved area structure plan area. So there is growth going to happen there. Okay, and this one between uh, Calgary and Cochrane. Yeah, so that's Harmony, okay. and uh, and that is uh, you know it's approved as well. But uh, you know we're showing some some room for that that to expand, and it it fits nicely in the um, the plans for Harmony fit nicely into the uh, preferred preferred um, place types. Okay, perfect. And that was a question we'd had in advance was why isn't Harmony a preferred growth area? So yeah, it is. It is it, sure. and, it, and, and this plan is, it fits very nicely into that master plan community uh, description. And the uh, tutors asked about the orange areas. So I, I don't know if yeah. we have another slide specifically on that. So if you could go to the next slide, I can speak specifically to them. So those orange areas are the joint planning areas. And the joint planning areas are really important because they are the areas where, as I, I just mentioned, that we, we see you know, the, the next expansion of, of um, urban and suburban growth. And so there are areas where growth impacts on multiple municipalities and where servicing is gonna be important to support that growth. So it's gonna be more than just rural development. These are, these are gonna be, need to be fully serviced areas. Um, there's gonna be there places where there's opportunities to benefit from coordinated um, servicing between municipalities um, because in many cases they, they um, they border on more than one municipality. There's always opportunities in those cases to, to possibly share and, and, and get efficiencies out of those uh, um, intermunicipal uh, servicing opportunities. Um, there are places where sub-regional planning is important. We heard this early on in the process from uh, um, many of the uh, board members that they wanted to see sub-regional planning uh, within the region. And we agree with that. And I think these joint planning areas offer that opportunity. Um, we are, um, requiring context studies be done to coordinate planning amongst the municipalities. And this really is just getting the municipalities to sit down and talk together and to make sure that they, uh, they are taking advantage of, of the opportunities that are there and being as efficient as, as possible. And finally, the board can create uh, new joint planning areas um, as, as there's need, um, need and opportunity. Okay, next slide. Just to quickly touch on the, um, the Hamlet growth areas, um, unlike um, the joint planning areas, these are independent local areas that are predominantly in a rural environment. So they're not, uh, they're not connected to a, another municipality. Um, and the intent is these Hamlet growth areas become the, the service centers for the sur surrounding rural areas. Not all that different than many Hamlets do, do today, um, but we are making provisions to allow for new ones or substantive growth in some, some that exist. Um, and again, they accommodate growth opportunities that don't border on the existing uh, urban municipalities. And the intent is to, to try to enhance the rural character by strategic, strategically um, placing nodes uh, throughout the region. 
And like the uh, joint planning areas, the board may designate uh, new hamlet growth areas um, in the future. Uh, next slide. Steve, I wonder if you might speak to, um, I guess, the regional significance element of this. We're getting some questions and, and people sort of sharing, you know, does this mean that Calgary has a veto on what I do on my, um, my own individual land as a landowner? And maybe if you can speak to the concept of regional significance. So uh, I'll, 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 the question around votes, I'm going to defer to Jordan, but around regional significance, yeah, the, the regional significance is, is um, more around creating different uh, types of development in different parts of the region to serve different, uh, different needs. You know, we know that downtown Calgary is not Langdon um, and, and uh, you know, and each of those places need to have their own character. And so the, the idea of, of creating different types of, of future growth areas are intended to recognize those differences, but also recognizing the joint planning areas are those areas where, as I said, we're going to have new suburban and, and urban growth and they need to be planned in a manner to, to, support, um, to support that with, you know, jobs and, and, and population and servicing and all that sort of thing and in a, a way that is coordinated um, between them. On, on the issue of the voting structure, Jordan, I don't know if you want to jump in here or we come back to that. Let's maybe finish this off and then, then we'll come back. Yeah, sure, okay. Uh, maybe next slide, Anne. Is that this? That's, this will be our last one, or just about our last one. So we all have also written in a policy around exceptions. Um, we know that there's always something that uh, comes up that uh, you know that our future crystal ball is not perfect. Uh, there may be some opportunity comes up in the future that just doesn't fit with the growth plan. Um, so we want to make sure there's the ability to deal with exceptions and give the board the, the, um, the authority to deal with those exceptions without having to completely amend the growth plan. So, you know, where there's a demonstrated economic need and there's regional benefit, um, you know, there's an area we could be looking at um, that don't compromise the goals, objectives of policy of the growth plan and where we're not seeing just a pattern of, of that, that a municipality doesn't turn around and use this as a way to, to circumvent the growth plan. Um, but the idea being that if there is something comes up that has, you know, that is of regional significance and, and there's an economic need and it's something we hadn't um, uh, hadn't seen and, and um, anticipated and no plan can ever anticipate everything going into the future, uh, we want to make sure there is the ability for the board to, to have the authority to, to look at those exceptions as, as they need to. And did you want to go on to these, want to finish up this slide and then go to the Q&A? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so let's just jump to the next slide. So finally, we do have an area on, on um, celebrating urban and rural differences. And it's there as, um, because it is one of the board goals. We don't have any specific policies on this because the other policies are intended to highlight um, you know, some of the differences within the region. Uh, but it is important. And, and I think uh, we wanna make sure that it stays in the growth plan and, and recognizes the board's goals for the region and, and they're important ones. Um, so one is the Calgary region has uh, grown in a way that celebrates the individual character of our municipalities while working together to build a stronger region. And then the second one is that the region has worked, worked together to make our developments perform better financially, environmentally, and socially. And that's really what a lot of the um, policies that are in the growth plan are, are trying to achieve is both of those, uh, both of those goals. Right. And with that, I think I'll pass it back to you, Anne. Fantastic. So we'll keep you on and we'll bring Jordan on as well. Um, and, and so we've probably got about 10 minutes here, here for questions. And I see we've got a few folks with hands up too. And so, so thank you very much to everyone. I think we've, we've had, you know, over 50 questions and probably 60 or 70 come through in various forms. So I've, we've been doing our best to keep track. Um, what we will do is, is offer the opportunity. There are places on the engagement website, as I said, in the discussion forum, that's the best place to um, continue making sure that, that your views are shared and that your questions are asked that we're able to answer. Um, but I am gonna focus on the Q&A box and those um, questions that have sort of been upvoted. And so if you want to make sure that, that your questions are addressed, that you want to um, amplify those from your neighbors, please do use that function, just the little thumbs up um, icon next to questions you wanna make sure that we cover in the next bit. Um, and so there's one from Ken about uh, Highway 1 Regional Transportation Corridor. 
So how many tourists drive through the area from Calgary to mountain parks? Um, why would I see the mountain parks? Why not leverage that for economic development and tourism? I assume as, as a growth area. So I'll, I'll jump in at first and Jordan may want to expand on this a little bit. I, I will start by saying that the growth plan is not an economic development plan, but it doesn't mean it can't support economic development. Um, so it doesn't mean that, that things that, that take advantage of, of those tourists couldn't, couldn't develop. Um, but the intent here is that there will be follow-up work. Um, you know, the growth plan is not the end of the, the CMRB's uh, life and uh, certainly transportation planning and uh, economic development planning are, are things that uh, are likely in this future. But Jordan, I think you could probably speak to that better than me. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I think that uh, it's important to note that the growth plan is not gonna cover all uh, contingencies. And that as Steve has already highlighted is that there, there is the ability to make changes as we go forward under the growth plan. That doesn't mean that we need to go back to the minister and have an entire new plan uh, revisited. However, the board has uh, multiple opportunities expressed their desire to focus on regional economic development on the go forward and build on the work that they've done from the growth plan. Okay, perfect, so thanks for that. Um, I'll just take a couple on the um, on the engagement. So again, um, talking about sort of the opportunities that were were offered, um, we've leaned heavily on municipalities. So we know that municipalities um, know how to contact their residents the best, and so we've been working closely with each of the ten um, municipalities to make sure that their residents were aware of the phase one and phase two opportunities. Um, and had all the materials that they needed to, to be able to um, support and promote the, the processes and, and invite that input. And so those, that was a heavy lean on us to, because we know that municipalities know their residents. And so that was the opportunity to um, make sure that residents were contacted in the way that their municipality thought would, would be best for them. Um, Jordan, can you speak again to the votes? We, we still have questions on, on sort of the, does Calgary have a veto on what happens on an individual landowner's property? So it gets a little granular, but what I would say is that the region, what we're doing is looking at issues that have regional benefit. If there's something that uh, can be leveraged by working together, then that it's something that the CMRB has taken uh, a pretty strong interest in. And so that is why, you know, looking for more contiguous and slightly more dense development uh, allows for more efficient servicing and, and better development of those types of projects, which is more efficient, more cost-effective. Uh, in terms of, you know, a specific piece of land, we're creating a framework under which municipalities will be doing the planning. So that it has to meet the framework, but each municipality will need to, uh, will be responsible for planning their own land and what uh, this looks like in uh, on the ground. So as Steve mentioned, so for uh, Hamlet growth areas, there's only a requirement that 60% be in a preferred place type. The other 40% can be a different uh, flavor, a different development type, and that's allowed. When we get a statutory plan that comes forward, uh, if it meets the, uh, the requirements of the growth plan, does the board have the ability to vote on it? Yes, they do. And um, to be clear, for something to pass, uh, it requires seven votes and one of those votes must be Calgary. Okay, perfect. Um, and I guess just a question about intention. So is it the CMRB's intention to limit urban sprawl and develop within current city, Calgary city limits? So I, I think that there's a number of ways that planning gets done. And in some other regions, you saw what they call, you know, a hard municipal boundary. Um, and that's not the way that we went. We, and, and Steve, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. In terms of the original uh, analysis that was done is that it was discovered that except for uh, Foothills County, as Steve has already alluded to, every municipality either had in um, within their current uh, urban boundary or under plans, uh, approved statutory plans that were already approved, they could accommodate their percentage of the next million people, right? So, and if you uh, go back to the, the benefit, we're looking at 41% reduction in land consumption. And so that slightly, you know, uh, slightly more dense and, and more contiguous allows us to have that reduction in land consumption. And so is it a hard urban boundary? No. Does it have the effect of needing less land to grow? That is the effect. Okay, thanks a lot. 
Um, some questions just about the process in itself that the CMRB has hired a consultant to do this work. Um, and a question about uh, how much the consultant's been, been paid or sort of the consultant's role in, in this process. Yeah, so uh, the consultants, uh, we put it out for uh, RFP back in, I wanna say April of 2019. And through a competitive bid process, uh, HDR Calthorpe was selected. Um, I want to say that the proposal uh, was in that one, uh, about a little over a million dollars between one million and one point four million dollars. Uh, and as the consultants are meeting the uh, the requirements of the growth plan, we are, um, you know, obviously paying them for their work. Okay. Does the plan address annexation? No, that was not given to us in the mandate from the province. Annexation still follows, uh, still falls under the municipal government board and soon to become the land and property rights tribunal. Okay. Um, so Karen notes it's taken decades to get to 1.5 million people. So what is the time horizon that's projected for this next million? So when we did the population projections, they're done on every five year basis and sometime between 2048 and 2053 is when uh, under the population projections, which were done in 2018, is when we were projected to reach a million. Perfect. Um, so how will JPAs work? So the joint planning areas, if a rural municipality already has an area structure plan in place. And again, I think we've had some questions just on area structure plans being grandfathered in. And so I think just if we can clear, clarify what we're not talking about and what we are talking about. Yeah, in many ways, a, um, a context study for a joint planning area will consolidate um, many of those, the, the other plans that have been done already. Um, it's a chance for the, for the um, participating municipalities in a joint planning area to take a look at their, their individual planning that they've done because most area structure planning and municipal development plans have been done by um, one, one singular municipality. So it's a chance for them to take a look at and say, hey, is there a way to, way to do this more efficiently if we, uh, if we consolidate them? It might be that they've got an intermissible development plan that already covers everything. You know what? Work's done. That's, that's great if they've already done the work themselves, but we know that's not the case in all, all joint planning areas. And it is an opportunity for the, the municipalities involved in those joint planning areas to sit down and have, have that discussion and, and determine if there are ways to, to do things more efficiently. It really is uh, focused predominantly on efficiency and creating uh, creating certainty um, in those areas around uh, development patterns. Awesome. I want to bring in, so I so I see there's a couple of hands up and I'm recognized that we've been doing all the talking. And so Tudor, I'm wondering, I'm going to open your mic and see if just there's any co last comments or thoughts you want to leave us with here. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You're good. Okay. Thank you so much. So I appreciate the presentation. It's the first time I'm attending uh, this presentation of this kind, and it's great to, to get a better understanding of what the regional plan is for, uh, you know, for our part of the province, because in the end, you know, Calgary is the largest city in the province, and it has so much impact over the other satellite uh, communities around it. Um, and then one of the questions that you did pose, and I do appreciate it. I just wanted to be a bit more specific. I wanted to know. What models from around the world have you look? Are you looking at for better practices how to do this? And I'm just going to go a little bit longer in the question because I'm a big fan of history. And Calgary, from post World War II, with the discovery of oil, really went to look on how to develop its urban uh, area to places like Texas and the United States because of this oil and gas connection. However, even though there's some positives there, there came a lot of negatives, such as urban sprawl and over-dependence on vehicles and all these other like negative externalities that we see today. So I, I'm curious to hear, what does the board plan, where does the board plan to look in order to have a new approach, a new model, and not only look in this kind of Western part of North America for what they would consider to be sustainable development, because we should start looking outside across both ponds, both on the West and on the East uh, for better models. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tudor. Yeah, so a great, great question. And I, I think you're right. You know, we do need to look, um, look at a variety of different places. We have drawn on um, experience from predominantly North America, but um, there is some international experience drawn on as well. 
we did a, a good sort of scan of, of what the, the um, regional planning practices were across Canada um, in all of the, the major centers across Canada, put a real focus on there, looked at who was successful, but also drew quite a bit from the United States um, and looked at some of the areas in particular that have, have done a good job of um, evolving from that, that, as you suggest, that car oriented um, type of region to something that's a little more, a uh, little bit more sustainable. So places like Salt Lake, Portland, um, even LA, I think everybody thinks of LA as this really car dominated area, but they've, they've really made some, uh, some moves to evolve themselves as a region. Um, but, you know, really not, not looking at one and saying, hey, we're going to model ourselves after this place. It's really looking at the, um, you know, the benefits that we're seeing in all kinds of different places that, uh, and taking bits and pieces from, from many of these, uh, many of these locations. And they are, they are international in context, you know, Peter Calthorpe's um, background in, in this area is, is right across the world. Um, and so we, we've drawn on, on those, on the good experiences we've seen in lots of places, but really looking at those places that are, are, you know, how, how to evolve a place over time and not just a radical, radical shift or do something completely different than you've done in the past. Thanks a lot, Steve. And, and I think we'll, we'll call it there. Um, as, as we mentioned, we have two more open houses, but don't leave yet. I have a couple more polls that I just want to finish off with um, to see if, if this information was helpful in helping you learn about the plan or meeting your expectations. So uh, Lara, let's launch those last, uh, last three polls while we still have our folks on the line. Um, so just wondering if this provided information that helped you learn about, about the regional growth plan. Um, as, as we said, we knew some people had spent some time on the website, others not as much. And so uh, just wondering if this, this was the right level of information for you. We know it's, it's complex work and there's a lot to unpack in lots of details. So we were hoping to, to find that right balance. Um, so we'll just give a couple more seconds for folks to finish off uh, answering here. And okay, we'll close that one up. And, uh, and share those results. So that's perfect. So we um, generally people hopefully got something out of this. So either met some or, or all of your expectations uh, for learning for, for most of you for about 80%. Um, and then with the next poll, I'll put that up there. Um, we wanted the opportunity for you to be able to participate, uh, recognizing the virtual space in both questions that we would have, as well as getting information and, and sharing in the chat and, and bringing in some of those voices. Um, so again, just hoping uh, for some feedback if we met that. Uh, met that. And, and I guess if, if we haven't met those expectations, either for learning or participation, um, if you could maybe share in the chat. Uh, either privately or, or for everybody, just what you were expecting that you didn't get out of this that will help us improve for the next uh, two sessions that we have. Um, and so Lara, we'll close this last one up and I think we have one final poll. Oh, is if, if you're gonna, um, gonna respond on the website and, and engage. So I will ask that last poll there. Perfect, and so just wondering if after this you will participate um, in the discussion forum and or fill out the survey, as I said, those are the two um, mechanisms that, that the board will be using um, to, to say, hey, what's the level of comfort? What are the interests? What are people most worried about and, and how and, and most excited about in terms of the plan? Um, and so looking for, for if, you, if you will or if you've already filled out or if, if you're still not totally sure. Um, so if you can answer those, that would be really appreciated. Awesome. So I'll show you that one back and two minutes over, but hopefully that was that was worth it to get the information out. Thank you so much to Stephen Jordan um, for joining me in this conversation. As, as mentioned, we'll have a couple more next week on um, Tuesday with a focus specifically on economic um, impacts and opportunities related to the plan. And next Thursday night, We'll have a session as well, uh, speaking more to the environmental um, impacts and opportunities related to the plan. So thank you very much for, for attending um, and we, we hope you'll join us on the website and, uh, and continue to be engaged. Have a great day, everyone.